Welcome in to another edition of Talking Ducks. Lots to get to. National Signing Day is behind us, and we'll tell you more about the special event that Oregon put on up at the Nike campus. And we also got essentially the Mount Rushmore of interviews, so we'll be rolling those out over the next couple of weeks. Plus, we'll give an update on Kayvon Thibodeau after a sensational rookie season. We'll let you know whether or not the sky is the limit for him. We'll touch base on basketball, men's and women's basketball in action. The men starting to get some momentum. Women, however, still trying to hang on to their NCAA tournament hopes. And then we'll give you our Super Bowl picks because, yeah, you care about that, right? That's what you're tuning in for is Super Bowl picks. Let's go ahead and get to our opening drive brought to you by Les Schwab Tire Centers where they've been doing the right thing since 1952. And Aaron, it's a two-man show here today. So Aaron Ventures from the Oregonian joining us here today. And Aaron, you were at this National Signing Day event, which they called Signing Day Live, or Signing Night Live, excuse me. And this was up at the Nike campus. And this was a pretty big event because Oregon, of course, brought in a bunch of boosters. You bring in the current roster, and you're going to highlight all the players that they're signing for next year's team but the really cool part was that you bring in a bunch of former players from all these different generations and you get everybody underneath one roof and you kind of celebrate the current state of Oregon football and what's coming next. And it almost had this wedding rehearsal dinner vibe, right? Where everyone's pretty relaxed and you're getting ready to welcome in a new member of the family and all these people are coming together and, and just being there. And we got a chance to get interviews with, I mean, you name it, Marcus Mariota, Sabrina Ionescu, We've got Bo Nix coming in there, Ahmad Rashad, all those guys. What was it like for you just being in the room and getting a chance to just see so many generations of Oregon football come together for one night? You know, it's weird. Part of me felt like uh, Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible infiltrating <laughs> a heavily secured building because, you know, I'm a media member there. And of course, I was there because I'm on this show and the show was allowed to be there. So that was interesting. And then uh, also, I didn't realize that there were going to be that many former players there. Like, I thought there'd be a couple. But I stood up on the second floor looking down and it was like going, the, you know, back in time in the time machine in the DeLorean to all the different guys I covered over the years because I've covered that program for so long. Of course, Mariota was there, Grasso, gosh, Javon Hollins, McKinley, Royce Freeman, Hollins, like there's so, Dennis Dixon, Ed, Ed Dixon, you know. Uh, Ed Dixon, I covered in the NFL as well. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun going around saying hi to those guys, and none of them wanted to beat me up, you know, so that was good. <laughs> That's always nice. Um, and then my favorite part, actually, because I I've never I never really covered Sabrina. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, other than talking about them on the show, I never really wrote about the women's team. Um, and so I went to say hi to Hironis, who I covered his entire career, and Sabrina's standing right there, and then we're, you know, we're, we're – chopping it up and I go, dude, introduce me, introduce me, introduce me. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally Sabrina goes, I'm Sabrina. I go, hi, I'm Aaron Fitch. Uh, so no, it was fun. It, it was fun seeing a lot of those guys. And one of the things I love about covering college football really is uh, you see the kids coming. I told some guys this. I told a group, Royce, Crosby, Hollins, and Reagan, I told this. You come, I see you guys coming in 18 and you're just kids and you think you're the man, right? And then I watch yeah. you grow up. And then post college, if I bump into your CP, they married or have kids, or they just they're adults now. And it's just fun watching that transition. Well, let's talk about where they begin at, and that's this year's recruiting class. A lot of defensive linemen coming in. I mean, what do you make about it? Eighth ranked class nationally, and that's saying something for Oregon, considering you've got a new coaching staff that came in last season. You're competing with a lot of other schools that have been knocking it out of the park as far as the Alabamas, the Georgias, the Ohio States. Where does Oregon stand, and what does this mean for the Ducks? Because obviously you take it all with a grain of salt. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've learned over the last several years that recruiting class rankings, uh, they mean something, but they cannot always mean what you think they're going to mean. If, if, I, if you have four, 15 four-stars and only six work out, it kind of dilutes, obviously, the impact of the class. Clearly, Oregon's been good, but the defense has been suspect. You, you didn't find a quarterback in the last six years. You didn't find a star running back in the last six years. Uh, although, I mean, Die was the backup to Verdell. That's the closest Verdell was recruited by Gary Campbell back in the day. Um, and you're ta you do have a receiver in Franklin, so you found one good receiver. But, yeah, defense last year, they had three five-star kids on it, and the defense was mediocre. So that, that tells you something, and now they're all gone except for Manning. Uh, so, you know, the proof's in the pudding. The proof's in what you see on the field. And that's always been the case. And this is a program that when they were contending for national titles, they weren't getting classes like this. But 
the blur offense was a thing. And then, of course, you had Marcus come online. Uh, so, yeah, we, we just got to see it. You know, I, I, I think anyone who has followed college football long enough knows there's just a big difference between four-star on paper and four-star on the field. Uh, another thing, 15, tra- 15 kids in the transfer portal. These are all, you know, recruits on their crystal ball that were supposed to be stars. So we'll see. But, hey, that said, how could you not be happy? Because it's a top 10 class. If you have a top it 10 is. class, that means you have a lot of bodies and talent to work with, and you just have to hope that the talent evaluation is on point this time. Because sometimes that stuff can be inflated, even from the coach's standpoint. Where I've, And I've talked to coaches about this across the country who've admitted that this happens, where, oh, well, we didn't get the guy we wanted, but that guy's a four-star. Let's get him because he's a four-star. It boosts our rankings. So you hope that with Lanning that Lanning's not doing much of that and that you really have a boatload of dudes on this team. Yeah, and then it finally comes down to player development, right? You get these guys in the door, and then it's your your culture, your coaching, your schemes. There's so many things that can impact it, of course. And, yeah, you need talent to do stuff with. It comes down to Johnny's and Joe's instead of X's and O's at the end of the day. But if you can get enough talented players in – and get them with player development, you're good to go. Now, you just have to look at Utah in the conference, back-to-back conference titles, and they haven't had top 10 classes. What number is Utah, by the way, Aaron? I looked up their class rankings, either the four or five years leading up to this to this past season, and then their average ranking was like 44. There you go. So it and comes Oregon's down to was 11. And, culture, and, and Oregon's it, it was feels 11. like Oregon, real quickly, Aaron, it, it feels like there's just some peace with the program, right? There's been so much turmoil with coaches changing and whether or not guys are going to go. Landing year two, you got the vibe that everyone just felt good about where this program's at. Yeah, you know, when, when Mario left, which I said was going to happen for four years of Miami came calling, people freaked out, right? It was like, oh my God, this is crazy. I can't believe this is happening. And after I said, told you, I also tweeted, don't fret. Don't, well, I took so much garbage for four years. I had to rub it in a little bit. But I tweeted also, don't worry, relax. There will be life after Mario Cristobal. Like Mario Cristobal is a good football coach, but he wasn't Nick Saban. Like he wasn't some can't miss him always <laughs> five, na- five national titles. You can go out and find another good coach. Heck, you you fell into Cristobal because Taggart left, right? So it's not like you know Cristobal was this wanted man across the country and you got him. No, you default. You hired him because the kids wanted him because Mark, because right. So, but they did rebound well. And you got a young up and coming coach who's going to be a head coach somewhere around the country during his career for the next 20, 30 years. We'll see how long he lasts at Oregon. But yeah, he's, he's doing a good job. There's no doubt about it. Now they lost to Washington. They lost to Oregon state. That's not good, but you won 10 games. You won a bowl game and you just had a huge recruiting class. And he just seems like the type of guy that you'd want to be leading your program. And he's going to make mistakes. He's going to learn because he's a new coach. So be patient but yeah, yeah, I think I think the, the program's in, in great You're shape. You're asking right a now. lot for any fan base to be patient. You know that. I know, I know. But I, I, I try to bring a, be, be a calming influence at times. It's all good. <laughs> well, hey, Aaron, when we come back, we're going to hear from Jeff Schwartz. Here's one of our mini interviews at Signing Night Live. He's got a lot to talk about, including the state of the Oregon program, the recruiting class and whatnot. Don't go anywhere. A two-part interview with Jeff Schwartz just around the corner. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Welcome back. Time now for What's Cooking, brought to you by Sam's Northwest Barbecue, the Northwest's largest brick-and-mortar barbecue store. You can find them located in Sherwood, just south of Portland, your home for Yoder Smoker products and so much more. And Jeff Schwartz, one of my good teammates at Oregon, huge offensive lineman, had a nice little career with the Ducks, but did a terrific job of coming into the NFL as a free agent and lasting eight years in the NFL He's now very busy with a variety of things, has a podcast, has a Sirius XM radio for Pac-12, also does some stuff for Fox Sports. He had a chance to join us at Oregon Signing Day to give his thoughts on this past season for Oregon and what the Ducks can do to continue to try to get to that next level. Here's our conversation with Jeff Schwartz. All right, we're here with former Oregon offensive lineman and NFL lineman for eight years, good friend of mine, teammate of mine, Jeff Schwartz. Jeff, thanks again for being here, man. You're looking good. Thank you, man. Glad to be here. <laughs> hey, feeling the sleeve ducks, stuff. I love it, yeah. Hey, you know, it's great. Let's, let's get into signing day, first yes. of all, because obviously this is an Oregon team that needs to continue to recruit in order to compete at those high levels. Just general thoughts on maybe the holes they need to fill yeah. and what you think about the hall for this year. 
Well, very clearly, Lanning had a goal of beefing up the defensive line. I mean, that was a clear, we saw this year, whether it was the Georgia game or the Oregon State game, like, we need to get better on the defensive line. And I think he got 10, 11, 12 guys via either the portal or recruiting to beef up that defensive line. Because, look, in the title game, Georgia ran out there a true freshman defensive tackle that got a sack in a title game. A true <laughs> freshman defensive tackle. He'd be the best guy in our conference, right? Like, we need to have that depth to compete at that level. So I liked him attacking those positions in um, – in recruiting, I think we hit some of those you know, kind of must-need positions in the portal as well to attack wide receiver, cornerback, safety, things like that, offensive tackle as well. So I think we hit the right, you know, the right pieces. But it's about guys; it's a bodies game, right? You have to have bodies to compete at a national level, and he understands that. This has been a common refrain for this program, though, for a long time. They don't always get guys as large as yes. you. And by the way, we let me just say that I covered these guys back in the day, and I was still holding on to my hairline. Uh, I gave it up shortly after. But anyway, so it's nice to be between these two. Uh, they're all married and have kids now. It's just weird. But anyway, uh, why do you think Oregon has struggled to really put together? Because it's one thing to have Haloti, yes. then Armstead, um, Buckner, and then Kayvon, yeah. but to have three or four of those guys together in one class, why yeah. is it so difficult for Oregon to put that together? Well, it's difficult for anyone on the West Coast. The bodies just aren't here on the West Coast, right? right? They're just not available. Um, and then I think even with kind of what happened during the COVID years, you know, the players, because of, there wasn't much high school sports, they just kind of even left the region even more. They're like, we want to go play high school sports somewhere else. They, mm -hmm. they left even more. So there's just less players in the region. If you look yeah. at, at the rankings right now, there's less offense alignment, there's less defense alignment. And it is hard, as, as good as Oregon recruits, to say, hey, come from the south to play defensive line right. in Eugene, Oregon. And it's hard to do that. And I think they're doing the best they can to make that happen. But then also then the development has to happen, right? So you bring kids in, you develop them. But it's hard to get seven, eight, nine of those guys. Yeah. But the transfer portal makes that a little bit easier now. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you get players that say, hey, I'm, I went to A&M, I went to Georgia, I went to South Carolina, I don't really fit here, I'll come to Eugene now. And that makes it a little bit easier to build up. But there's just not a lot of players on the West Coast anymore. Yeah. And I think the, the COVID years kind of accelerated the, the migration of those players out of our region even more. You know, Jeff, is a really interesting season because you start the year off yeah. playing a Georgia team that is arguably one of the best programs we've seen in the last 15, 20 years as far as what they've built over the last yeah. couple of years. You're one or two plays away from winning 12 regular season games with the losses to Washington, Oregon State. You're bringing Bo Nix back. I think for a lot of Duck fans, the question is, how far away is this Oregon team from being in Final Four contention, being at the level of a Georgia? Is it even conceivable, or how do they close that gap now? Would it take Kirby Smart six years to make a playoff? Mm. Right, like mm. it takes time to build your roster. That now, right. could you make a case Oregon can take this team to a playoff next year? Sure, I could say that. I mean, it's possible. TCU did it last year too. But are we saying to compete to beat Georgia? That takes many years to do. It's not just a one-year thing or two-year thing. Mm. It takes many, many years to build these classes up over and over and over again to build the depth and to get these guys. So, I think, look, I'd love to say next year winning a title. <laughs> like, it just, it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way, right? Like it doesn't work that way. You have to be. I think. The 14 playoff, and we're going to be the, uh, about to get the 12 team playoff, has really changed our expectations for the sport in a bad way, I think, mm -hmm. right? Like, I it, it used to be, and I know we discuss it all the time about expectations, right? Like, 10 wins is good. Yeah. Now, of course, yeah. I think Oregon fans would say, well, losing to Washington, Oregon State's not good, and I agree to that. Mm -hmm. But 10 wins is 10 wins. It's hard to win 10 games. Many schools will take 10 wins mm -hmm. every single season. And we look at it, well, you didn't make a playoff. Okay. We still won 10 games. But only 14 it's, made it, the right. it's hard to do. Like, so I think we're close to being that playoff team, and maybe we are next year. Mm -hmm. But the margin for error is so small in our conference. Mm -hmm. right? Bonix hurts his leg. We talked about dinner last night. Bonix yeah. hurts his leg. One play at the end of the game in Washington, and boom, it's, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we might be a playoff team. We'd also be a great team to win 11 games next season and not make the playoffs. Yeah. So like, the, the, defining our success by only making a playoff to me is not the spirit of college football. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the transfer portal. I'm of the mind when it comes to quarterback, I'm not even sweating these high school kids. Everyone freaked out when Dante Moore flipped yeah. to mm -hmm. UCLA, but we just saw what Lanning did with the transfer portal yeah. and getting Bo Nix. It just seems like every year there's going to be a bunch of quarterbacks yeah. who didn't work out someplace, who are hot shot recruits, who are going to be available, and maybe you have more yeah. tape on them, more idea of what they're going to be. How do you feel about recruiting the quarterback via transfer yeah. portal or high school? I think you still need a mix of both. I think people, because Dante Moore, I think is really good. Mm -hmm. like, I think that's the difference is like, when I watch him play, and I watched a little bit of him that all-star game recently, I was like, oh boy, he can sling it. I think, and I think people- <laughs> Well, that's what and, people said and, about time. I know. Yeah. And, and there's a stigma too of like, I want that five-star kid, right? right? There's like some of that as well. But you're right, right? Like in previous years, if you had lost a Dante Moore, that'd be the end of your program for three years. <laughs> right? Like, oh my God. And, and, you know, and, and look, Bo's gonna play one more year. Right. He'll be gone. 
maybe the new kid they brought in from you know from from Texas, he'll be the kid, or they'll just find someone next year in the portal. Right. Right. right, and like it can, and, and so it's it's. It used to be a, a four to five year thing, right? We bring a guy in and we plot his course out. Now it's like, well, all right, well, let's go get someone else after a year. So it changes the way you look at your program if you're a coach. And yeah, the portal, I mean, look at our conference, right? Look at what Caleb Williams has done, what Bo Nix has done, what Michael Penix has done. Mm-hmm. And it's changed the fortunes, even heading into this year with DJU at Oregon State. Like it's changed the fortunes of a lot of teams in our conference. You know, it's funny, Jeff. Going into next year, people are very excited about Bo Nix, some of the skill position yeah. players coming back. But you lose a lot on the offensive line. And the first thing I learned coming from a fan to a player is, good Lord, that offensive yeah. line is important. Like, yeah. you need to have a line if you want to get stuff done. What are you looking or seeing from Oregon's yeah. line for next season? Yeah, it's a good question. So they return, you know, Harris at, at, at left guard, and then JPJ will be somewhere, I would imagine, along the offensive line. So you have two guys coming kind of, I'm sorry, Harper, not Harris, Harper, yeah. um, at, at, at guard somewhere in there. And then you brought in the kid from Texas and the kid from Rhode mm-hmm. Island. So you have, you know, guys there. And then Connor Lee Jr., I'd imagine, will be at, at left. So you have your five guys there. There's, you know, a little bit of experience, inexperience, kind of a mixture there. Luckily, we don't start with Georgia next season. So, yeah. like, you get Portland State. So, you get, like, a little bit of a warm-up game. Hey. And then... I play there. Okay, right. sorry. Okay. And then and then we obviously hop into to, to Texas Tech and whatnot. But, like, you get a little bit of, like, uh, you know, not playing Georgia in their first game. Right. Um, so, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of adjustment period with the new offense as well, figuring out kind of what the offense, what you want it to be. Look, there is... I never fault any coach for leaving for a coaching job. I mean, you take the job that you can get, but there is a little bit. It takes a little time to kind of get a rhythm with, with, with a new offense. They have a kind of new offensive line as well. But luckily, we have guys that have played a little bit, mm-hmm. even though they're from different schools. And yeah. you come to the portal. That's the, yeah. that's how you do it now. Otherwise, mm-hmm. we'd have basically three and a half new offensive linemen. Now we have new guys, but guys who played 36 games, right. 20 games. So they they played point. football, yeah. and it helps when you have this kind of new unit all together. How do you feel about the state of the conference with USC and UCLA leaving? Maybe San Diego State comes in. Does Oregon <laughs> stay and be the, the premier along with Washington program in the conference? Or does Oregon need to try and leave? Oh, well, I, I think with the expansion of 12 teams now, it feels way better to stay. Doesn't it? Just Because you yeah. can like, run this thing for a correct, long time. Correct. And then you're automatically and in. Ab- absolutely. Right. Um, if, if it was a four-team playoff, maybe I'd be like, we'll fight for the, go to the Big Ten. But, like, I just – I just don't like it, honestly. You know, I just don't like, and I get why UCLA and USC did it. It's all about the money, and that's obviously what yeah. what, what the sport is now. I mean, we cover this. I love covering, but I also get paid to cover it. I'm not, <laughs> like, I'm not doing it for free, so I benefit from. You're doing this. Wait, this is well, this, this, this actually is free. Um, so, but the point is, like, you know, I, I just so it's all about the money. I, I get that, and uh, but I just don't like it. Like, I grew up a UCLA fan. I'm from Southern California. My, my parents, say that? No. My, my parents went to UCLA, <laughs> and it's like weird to me. And I root for the Bruins outside of football. I root for their basketball team, not obviously against Oregon, but like in a couple of years, I thought to myself, like, am I still going to root for them? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, why, why do I care if they're in the Big Ten now? I'm not going to watch. It's just a weird feeling to not have to worry about those two schools anymore. But for Oregon, Washington, Utah, as far as top of the football conference, it's your conference now, right? It's, right. it's you don't have to worry about UCLA and USC anymore. I also think that. It's not going to go as well as I think it is for them. Um, you know, it's just not. You're you're going to a league that cares more about sports, that has more resources to try to win in sports, um, and I just don't think it's going to go as well as I think it is. They get more money, sure, but I don't think they're going to win at the rate they, they have. All right, stick around. When we come back, we'll have more with Jeff Schwartz in part two of our interview with the former Oregon offensive lineman. You're watching Talking Ducks. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Where does Oregon differentiate itself moving forward at this point? How do you sell Oregon to a kid when everybody's got all the helmets, everybody's got the facilities, everybody's got the new shiny, sparkly thing? How does Oregon differentiate? And everybody's got money now, too. It's a good question. Um, I I think you sell them on, on you have to kind of wrap those things all together, right, and Mm -hmm. include player development. You say, hey, look, guys, we've sent a lot of guys to the NFL, Mm -hmm. and we continue to do so, and we're sending more guys to the NFL each and every year. 
and you know the lifestyle here at Oregon. You sell them come into a place like this, Nike. Like, hey, you can this opportunities. You can have it. All that has to be in it. But it also comes back to I think coaching development. Like, you have to feel comfortable. In the end, I know players are going now for money. It's a, a, for, you know that is the way it's it the is. The truth, yeah. But also, the like, but like you still have to be comfortable with the coach. You have to hire good people. Like, you have to hire good coaches that develop players that put them in the right places. In the end, a lot of players do want to be developed and go to the NFL, and that's one way you differentiate. But guys, we win a lot of football games though. Like I think mm -hmm. we've, we've had five. Five coaches now win 10 games, uh, I think, in like the last 15 years. Bilotti, Helfridge, Chip, Chip. Uh, yeah. Mario, and now Lane. Like, we win a lot of football games at Oregon. So there's a lot of winning involved here, a lot of player development, brand brand awareness, brand development. Those things all matter to players now. Mm -hmm. So as a person who played at Oregon, yeah, th th a lot of guys you played with for yeah. got fired. And then they go Taggart, yeah. Mario, Lang. Three coaches yes. in six years. Team, 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 yeah. Excuse me. Play, or coaches, sorry. Yeah. Are using Oregon as a stepping stone. Yeah. Yes. One, do you fear Lanning might do the same? And two, if he does, yeah. what does that say about Oregon's program? Well, I mean, I, sure. Um, look, I think we can look at, say, okay, Willie Taggart went to his dream school, which he did. Mm -hmm. And he turned but, into a nightmare. But, but then he failed. <laughs> right. Mario went to his dream school. Oh, that's that's not going right now. He's got to rebuild. He's, He's got to rebuild. But he, but he, but he, but he already fired off its corner in year one. Oh, shocking. Um, <laughs> and so, look, Lanning might leave. I mean, look, that's the sport. Like, I, I just don't fear. I, I'm not going to consume myself with that. It, yeah, sure, he might leave in two years. Like, that's just the way it is. And then we'll have to find another coach. Like, that, that's the reality of where Oregon's at. It, it's hard to, to claim otherwise. Um, I hope he stays for six years and eight years and sees this out, but that's not the story. How many coaches stay? I mean, look at Riley left Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Brian Kelly left Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. Like, to think that the coaches aren't going to leave Oregon, I think, is naive. Mm -hmm. um, so it might happen. I, I don't know. Lanning seems happy right now. Yeah. But, you know, with Mario, though, there was always that thought of when is he going to Miami? Mm -hmm. There was always that thought. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't fault Mario for doing that either. Yeah. Like I, but, like, there was always every year it was like, is this the year he goes to Miami? Mm -hmm. This year goes to Miami. I, with Dan Lanning, where, where's that like place? Is there isn't a thing. If Kirby place, Smart but, ever retires, yeah. right? Yeah, but yeah, but, that but Kirby Smart's like might, isn't Kirby like 48? This like, is true. He's gonna coach him for 25 more years. SEC, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Absolutely. But, but absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But but there's no like school where you're like mm. I have to worry about that specific right. school coming yeah. after him. Right. Um, but every school, like if Kalen DeBoer has one more good year at Washington. Every school is going to call him mm -hmm. in the Midwest and the South. Yeah. Like every school has to deal with this. You know, if 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 Mike McCarthy at the Cowboys has a bad year next year, guess what? Jerry Jones is calling Lincoln Riley. Hey, do you want to come be our coach? Yeah. Right. Like every coach has to deal with this right. at every level. So I don't worry about whether or not someone calls mm -hmm. Dan Lanning next year and says, "Hey, I think the, the structure here is good. The support here is great. He's recruiting well. Mm -hmm. We're winning football games." If he wants to leave. Okay, good luck yeah. somewhere else. Yeah, and to that point, it's clear that even, you know, Taggart shocked everybody when he left, but they recovered with Mario right. and won yep. a Rose Bowl. Yeah. Mario leaves, which some of us thought was coming, some people didn't, but then they recovered well with yeah. Manning, right? Mm -hmm. So they've landed on their feet each time. They have, so far. so far. But also, look, when people have left Oregon, they have done worse. Yeah. Right? Now, Chip left the NFL. You can't blame anyone for no. an NFL job. UCLA has never been Oregon. Mm -mm. Right. You know, Hal Fritch got fired, obviously. He's never been really coached anywhere else. Um... He was offensive coordinator in the Bears, right, for a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. quarterback coach, Name. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a Bears yeah. fan. Don't give me yeah. that, that, <laughs> that was Nagy. That was Nagy, okay. That was and then, and obviously, Willie, and then we'll, you know, yeah. we'll see what happens with, with Mario. But, like, Lanning has acknowledged that. He said, like, yeah. my predecessors have left and done worse elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that's a little bit of factor in, in the way he views leaving this job at some point. Yeah. Well, final question for you before yeah. you get going and catching up with everybody. You got any good story from when you played at Oregon, something that you can share with us here that maybe a lot of oh. people didn't get a chance to mm, learn dirt. about or know well, about or maybe just Bill something that you mind. really the, the, look the back on The one thing I'll say this, like, we were talking about this last night at dinner. Um, oh, no, here, here's Wait, what it is. You guys went to dinner. Please, please explain to hearing. us yeah. the genesis of win the That's day. A, okay. So, you know, obviously – Chip Kelly made win the day like his his mantra. John Neal, though, wasn't it? But well, it was it was Bilotti's team. It was like we we came together at yeah. Camp Harlow and we came up with it win the day. And like I give Bilotti so much credit for basically. I've never seen a coach like accept like I failed. Like mm. let's come together and figure this out as a team. Most coaches are 
don't do that. And this right. is following the and very disappointing yeah, so after, 06 Yes, yeah, so after the Vegas yeah. Bowl, we oh went God. out. We He got us all together. Uh, yeah, Jordan, yeah. Yeah, poor, my fault. Poor guy, yeah. My fault. Poor guy. <laughs> it was on me. It's on Jordan. Poor guy. <laughs> I had fun in Vegas, <laughs> though. Blows, yeah, so do we. That's the problem. <laughs> so do we. I remember seeing Haverly <laughs> and Leaf yeah, at, the, yeah. at the roulette table. Yeah, like so do we. Morning. Yeah, so do we. That, that was our problem. Um, so, you know, we had this, we, we, we go to this camp in my, early March, and we have this sit-down meeting, and Belize like, look, things don't, things didn't go well. They, they still don't taste good. You write down everything you hate about our program base. Like, he's, write me a letter. So we all wrote him a letter. I don't know if he read them eventually. But who knows? And then, and then, we're, and then, I don't know. I mean, we had 105 letters. I don't know if he read all of them. But then, and then it was like, okay. And then, he, and each table was like 12 players. Write down like everything you basically hate about the program. Write these big sheets of paper. We put them on the windows in this little uh, room. And then one player from each table read them out loud. Like, mm. like I don't like this, this, and this. And then the coaches got their opportunity to do the same to us. Oh. And it was Steve Greatwood who got up there, and he tore us, like, he shredded, <laughs> he shredded the players. Yeah. And then... The title, the yeah, all, stuff. all just yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Spoiled brats. And then afterwards, after that was done, Belize said, okay, that's done now. Mm -hmm. We're going to come up with a new way to run our program. Mm -hmm. And that's where when the day came out of. Mm -hmm. It was like, like just accountability. Like, like let's be more accountable to each other. Everything we do... Because th that year, you were on that team, like, we thought this... We, we, we had players that were like playing for the Vegas Bowl in like October. They were trying like trying to lose. Yeah, trying to lose because they were looking at like where the bowl structure was. If, if we like if we lose enough games, we'll go to Vegas Bowl, not El Paso. Are you serious? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Yes. I wasn't one of them, Eric. Like, <laughs> we, I know you would like, not do like, that. Like, 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 we, like, we had players How in the locker room. How many you missed? No, I was hurt. I was playing through. Not on purpose. Yeah. I, I was, uh, oh, no, no. I, I thought no, it was a screen pass, no. Dennis. My bad. I was only 20, buddy, so I couldn't even enjoy that. I couldn't oh, enjoy okay. it. Oh, that's I, right. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't enjoy the, ve <laughs> the Vegas Bowl. Cotton candy um, circus circus. Yes. I, yeah, I could not enjoy the Vegas Bowl. I was literally, like, just, yeah. all my lineman buddies were all 21. I just was, like, I was the youngest by like six, seven months sure. in my offensive line group. I just had to like sit in my hotel room all night. Yeah. I couldn't go out. Yeah. It was bad. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, like people were like, the locker room was toxic that year. It was yeah. bad. And so I give him credit for that. Now, we didn't like use win the day per se, like in 07. Like, it's not tattooed it on wasn't, you. Like, it wasn't like, but then obviously Chip brought it forth. But mm -hmm. I think Bilotti never gets the credit he deserves mm -hmm. for coming up with like that accountability system we had. Yeah, yeah. really good point because you look at where this program could have gone after that year and how fast things turned around. So, Jeff, appreciate it, man. As yeah. always, great yeah. to see you, my friend. Thank Looking you. fantastic. Jeff Schwartz, sure. ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, well, All right, big thanks to Jeff for joining us. Don't go anywhere. When we come back, Kayvon Thibodeau, the sensational rookie, had an excellent season. He catches up with us, and we learn a little bit more about how his first season in New York went. You're watching Talking Ducks. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Time now for some excellence on the field, brought to you by Ferguson Wellman. Ferguson Wellman bringing a disciplined approach to investing. Well, Kayvon Thibodeau had a sensational rookie season after being drafted in the top 10 of last year's NFL draft to the New York Giants. We had a chance to catch up with him and learn a little bit more about how the rookie season went and what he sees in his NFL future. I don't even know where to begin because Kayvon... You came in as a freshman that never squatted before. I interviewed you. <laughs> High expectations. You yes. exceeded them. High NFL draft pick. You exceed the rookie year expectations. Congratulations on all that. I think where I want to start is how was that transition for you? Going from college, now you've absorbed your first NFL season with true expectations on your shoulder. I mean, you come in with a rookie expected to do what you're supposed to do. Now that you've had a chance to sort of regroup after the year, how do you just reflect on this past year? I mean, it was definitely exciting. You know, it was something that, you know, I'll cherish forever because, you know, you're only a rookie once, as they all say. Um, but, God, you know, right? just just really <laughs> diving into it and really, you know, for me, our team, we for the Giants, we didn't expect to really be that good, you know, early. And I, I can't say I didn't expect, but the world didn't expect mm -hmm. for us to be good. But then, you know, once we start winning and I was really playing, it was like, you know, I'm, I'm went from just being a rookie to now I got to be a leader. Now I got to be ready and, and, and other guys are going to start looking at me. So just... I was just set up. I was blessed. You know, yeah, it, was a, it was a great opportunity. And now just going into my second year, I know what to do and what it's mm -hmm. going to take to really get over that, that next hump. We, well, so yeah. we were just talking about uh, sorry yeah. to jump in, yeah, but about yeah. being a leader and like yep. in that first year and you have so much to digest and you're in New York City. Mm. Like, it's not like you're going to Kansas City or it's not like you're going yeah. to even somewhere like Detroit or Baltimore. Like you're in you're in the Big Apple. Yeah. How different was 
the New York media. How different was it going from Eugene, Oregon to New York and then still having that expectation of leadership? I would say the greatest parallel between Eugene and New York was, was my mindset. You know, it was like knowing that I'm here with a purpose, I'm here with on a mission, and um, kind of sticking true to that. You know, with the media in New York, it's like everybody's always coming at you after every game. You know, whether you do good or you do bad, someone's always, you know, has something to say or has something to critique. But it's really just being true to yourself and understanding, you know, as long as I continue to be honest with myself and knowing what I need to get better at or when I broke down the film and I, I understood, you know, how I could take that jump in my game, um, everything else kind of fell into place. I got a funny story. We met, you don't even know we met, because it was your senior in high school. Okay. Okay, and uh, I was coaching at a high school, and we're going to coach and play against Eastside Catholic out of Washington. Oh. They came and played you your senior year, right? Yep, yep. So I'm watching number eight, correct? Yep, watching yep, number yep. eight coming off that edge. I'm like, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, wait. I'm thinking, and we got beat by Eastside Catholic by 50, by the way, yeah. and you and you blew them yeah. out of the water. Yeah. But I'm thinking, there's not a team in the country could beat this football team, and no one can block number eight, and yeah. that was you at the time. Yeah. And I was, and I tell you what, the day was that made my days when you signed with Oregon, knowing. He's going to do that. <laughs> and we had to hear about it for the next three yeah, years. Like, yeah. There's this guy coming at us, okay? <laughs> Keep an eye on him. It's like, yeah, we know him. Uh, right? right. You know, even from high school, I just I had a plan. Whether it was to dominate football and then come to Oregon, get my journalism degree, and then go to the NFL, it's all, you know, it, it hasn't been the easiest, but I've been trying to stay consistent and, and, you know, stay on my path, and everything's been going good so far. You know, Kayvon, it's really interesting to me because you and Justin Herbert, there's parallels in your greatness at Oregon. Couldn't have different personalities in the right. NFL. Let's right. be honest here. Right. Justin, you might get lucky to get him on camera. You yourself, you love the spotlight and you thrive yeah. in it. That approach to the game where maybe you are going to rub some people the wrong way because mm -hmm. of your confidence, right? Yeah. And that's important to have. How has that adjustment been for you? How have you processed and managed that as you go from yeah. a rookie now to a yeah. second-year player? I, I would definitely say, you know, understanding where you fit. You know, mm -hmm. it's er, everything is like a puzzle piece, right? You can never try to put yourself in a situation that's not good for you. So I've always tried to make sure that, you know, I'm around people who understand me. And, and even when I'm getting to know new people, I always, you know, I always keep that future. And what, yeah. what do I have in mind, you know, uh, in, in, in the forefront? So mm -hmm. I would say it's been great for me because I've been able to, you know, articulate myself and, and, and really get to know everybody around me and everything's yeah. been – uh, it's been all love and all up from here, but um, yeah, I would say it definitely is something that I had to pay attention to, and I, and I had to take heed to as I'm going to this next level. You, you've mentioned a couple times like having a plan, mm -hmm. and that plan is definitely more than football. Yeah, right. It, it's interesting, and, and maybe I'm off with this, but I, I feel like a lot of I'll say younger guys because you yeah. know we're all old <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. New guys, generation. well, but yeah. but guys who are now coming into the NFL have yeah. a better realization of yeah. that. Of the fact that your career isn't going to be forever, yeah. and you have to be planning for something else. Do you find yourself in the? I gotta say, are there more guys like you in the locker room in terms uh, of forward so, thinking? So it's so funny. I had a, an article was written on me, and they call me the modern athlete, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. or the modern football player, and it's just a perspective that we have an, a newfound understanding that we are multifaceted. I can be dominant on the field and still get straight A's. I can, mm -hmm. you know, um, excel in a podcast or whatever it is that you want to do and that you can grow in and still be dominant on the field. And I think, you know, for a long time we've kind of – we've underestimated athletes. We've underestimated the power. We've underestimated, you know, mm -hmm. the, the tools that, that we possess. And now yeah. that we're kind of unlocking them and they're no longer taboo, right? Mm -hmm. It's no longer taboo to talk about these things off the field. Mm -hmm. So you see guys more, you know, involved. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you talk about your, your, your plan. How does living in New York affect that plan or help that plan? I couldn't even imagine, you know, being a kid from L.A., I wouldn't even imagine going to the next, you know, the bigger big city. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for the two. And it's like, you know, uh, it, it's definitely been a great opportunity. And me being so young and um, having the awareness to seize the moment and knowing that I have all of these um, – former Giants and all of these mentors that, that are going to pour into me. Yeah. I mean, I've just been trying to take advantage of it and, you know, just continue to grow and make sure I seize every opportunity. All right, last question for you here, Kayvon. You're really exhibit A of exactly what Oregon's trying to do with recruiting. Mm -hmm. Bring in a top-rated player yeah. from somewhere outside of the state, have them come here and thrive. What is your message to that next recruit that Oregon's trying to get why Oregon? Because we've been having this conversation. Mm -hmm. You're no longer the only team with five helmets. Yeah. You're no longer the only team with underwater treadmills. Right. Everybody's got all that stuff. Why Eugene, Oregon? Why this program? 
I think when you choose Oregon, you choose yourself, right? For me, I didn't really know who I was. For most kids coming out, you don't really know who you are, but when you come to Eugene and you come to, you know, this area, you get a sense of self and you get to understand and you get a chance to blossom into um, who you are. And not only that, but the development and the, 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 the career development and the outside and all of the, the mentors. Me, my biggest thing in life is I wouldn't be here without the mentors and without you guys, you know, feeding into me. And I think that's what you that's what you get at Oregon. That's what I got. And I think that's when that's the culture that, you know, we continue to uh, to push. It's, it's a family. It really yeah. is. Yeah. It, it really is. is. Yeah. And we couldn't be more proud of you, man. Yeah. It's been great yeah. to see you grow yeah. over the last four yeah. years. Keep yeah. it rolling. Keep Appreciate that confidence. Keep, keep job, irritating man. people. I love exactly. it. Yeah. Keep celebrating. Yeah. You go. Keep doing there you. you. Go. That's what we got to do. Kayvon Thibodeau, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. All right, good stuff from Kayvon Thibodeau. When we come back, Aaron and I will break down his rookie season and whether or not New York will be a good fit for his confidence and bravado. Don't go anywhere. More talking ducks when we come back. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Welcome back. Time now for our legendary moment, brought to you by Abby's Legendary Pizza. And following that Kayvon Thibodeau interview, Aaron, obviously the young man doesn't lack any confidence or bravado. Let's take a look at what he did on the field, though. Pretty impressive rookie season. He had four sacks, two forced fumbles, 45 quarterback pressures in 16 games. And he was hurt for the early part of the season, kind of dealing with some nagging injuries. A lot of redraft boards, right? They do the redrafting of the 2022 NFL draft. Still have the Giants selecting him, with I believe was the number five pick. And so that right there says this was a wise investment by New York, and it feels like this is a good fit for Kayvon. What'd you take away from his rookie season? You know, I wasn't blown away. I mean, uh, the, the dude, the rookie from Detroit, Aiden Hutchinson, had nine and a half sacks. I mean, a little bit better season, or a lot better season statistically. But I think when you watched him play, you saw the disruption he can create. And as he gets better and gets stronger and, and learns different moves against uh, NFL offensive linemen, he's going to continue to improve because, man, when he, when he fires it up, when he's coming, he is a handful uh, as, as a pass rusher. And so, there's, you know, I, I would have zero doubt that he's, you know, going to have a, a very nice career. Is it going to be Hall of Fame? I can't go there. Is he even going to be all pro? I can't go there yet. I need to see more, but there's no doubt that he's going to be around for a while uh, getting after quarterbacks. Just don't, you know, just if you're going to sack a quarterback and do fake snow angels, don't do 10. <laughs> don't do 10 snow angels. And don't do 10 when the dude lying next to you is like out and That's hurt. like the, uh, just, what is that, it, the number of pumps with Hingle McCringleberry uh, that you got to be careful with? <laughs> <laughs> it's just not a good look, but limited to three or four snow angels per sack, you're good. Well, it's funny because you look at defensive linemen and you've had your Warren Saps, your Randall McDaniels, like these really boisterous personalities that walk around with a lot of bravado. And lately, it feels like we haven't quite had that. You've got some talented players. Don't get me wrong. The Bosa brothers, the Watt brothers, Hutchinson, some of the mess that these guys are causing. But do you feel like Kayvon might end up being that guy you love to hate and you're happy he's on your team, but you hate playing against him. We're kind of filling that almost enemy void, not quite to the level of like Dylan Brooks at Memphis, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but do you think like that's what he's going for, and is that going to work for him? Look, this is a, a highly intelligent cat. We all learned that day one yeah. when, he, when he came to Oregon, right? He, this is no dumb cookie, right? He knows what he's doing. He's smart. He's super smart, and uh, he, I, I think I think he maybe try, is trying to create sort of a persona of, of being – boisterous and a, a little bit obnoxious and sometimes that's going to backfire like when you're on twitter and and you you say who's joe staley or who are you referring to joe staley it's like ah, joe staley's one of the best left tackles of all time yeah, he's he's good. or even jeff saturday who are you i don't even know who that is jeff Sat you know so you're gonna step in it from time to time but that's part of maturing we talked about these kids got they, they gotta grow up right but I, I like the confidence he has, and I like the fact that he, he believes in himself and he's going out there and, and trying to deliver. Now, you have to deliver, and you're in the one city where you cannot afford to even remotely fall short, especially if you're talking mess. New Yorkers will run you out of town in a nanosecond. So he's got a lot of pressure just being a, a top 10 pick. Now add it to his mouth, how he's running it. That it makes it even more uh, pressurized for him to deliver. So, But I think he'll be okay. 
Yeah, he's kind of dealt with the pressure his whole life coming in as the number one overall rated recruit to Oregon and certainly living up to those expectations. All right, don't go anywhere. When we come back, we'll check in on hoops. Men's get the split in the desert. Women still struggling, losing five of their last six, but their tournament hopes are still alive. We'll hear from both coaches potentially when we come back on Talk to Ducks. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Welcome back. Time now for some talking numbers brought to you by Par Lumber, where let's get to the hardwood here. Men's basketball. They go down to Arizona and get the split. Now, here's what's interesting about Dana Altman and the team. They're getting healthier, and even though they lost to Arizona, whom they beat handily back in Eugene, they had to deal with the Julius Tabellas putting together one of the finest individual performances in the last six, seven years in the conference. He went off for 40 points, 16 of 21 shooting. There's not a whole lot you can do in a situation like that. On the road at McHale, not too many teams are going to pick up that win this year. The big win was at Arizona State. And how about Barthelemy coming off the bench, or excuse me, in the second half, going for 15 points in that second half. And Oregon finally correcting that outside shooting. And you can see how dangerous the Ducks can be when they start to be dialed in from beyond the perimeter. And when you look at that win over Arizona State, that was big because... I imagine both those two teams will be fighting for that fourth and final spot in the Pac-12 tournament where you get a bye in the first round. And for Oregon, let's be real, their chances of getting to the NCAA tournament right now most likely going to have to be a win in the Pac-12 tournament unless they pick up some huge wins down the stretch against USC, UCLA. But for the men, it feels like things are finally starting to come into form. They're getting healthy. They pick up the split. Now the rest of their schedule, you're hosting the Bay Area schools. You're at Oregon State, and they're going to be hosting the L.A. schools as well. So you have a little bit of a favorable schedule as you get set for the second half of conference play here. So Dan Altman and their team, still a lot of basketball left to be played, but it feels like they're finally starting to hit their stride. On the women's side, however, it has been difficult. They've lost five out of their last six. So let's go ahead and listen in to Kelly Graves to get the current state of the program as they continue Pac-12 play. The level of urgency right now is 10 out of 10. Uh, we know where we're at. We know what we need to do. I think we're still in position to, to get some good quality wins down the stretch. I don't think there's a single game left on our schedule that's not winnable for us. We obviously have to play really well and better than we have been. But, uh, yeah, I still think we, we're going to need three or four more wins, um, you know, to get ourselves into the NCAA tournament. So we've, we've got to find them. So, yeah, we talked about the sense of urgency and practicing with that this morning, you know, right before practice today. And we got to play that way right from the tip. We need to be the hungriest team. Yeah, always great to hear from Kelly, but from my observation, what we're seeing in the Pac-12 this year is that the middle of the conference has improved significantly. So if you look at your USC's, your Washington State's, Arizona is a program that's really starting to get better. Oregon's losses recently have been to Stanford and Arizona. Oregon State has always been very solid. So a couple of these games have just been one or two possession games where the team just can't get rolling out the get-go. And when you're playing from behind, it puts a lot of pressure on you. So for Coach Graves, obviously a lot of roster turnover. They don't have a Sedona Prince this year. It's some growing pains right now, but he loves the groups of players that he has right now. And this is a group that'll stick it through in my imagination. And so now all these losses, all this adversity is going to pay off huge for next year when this group gets a chance to mature one more year. So some more basketball left for Kelly Graves and company. But as you're learning out, the Pac-12 is starting to get a lot more difficult on the women's side. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Time now for our Rock Solid Pig, brought to you by Milan Stoneworks, bringing you the finest stoneworks in all the Northwest. And Aaron, we got a special Super Bowl coming up, man. It's the first time you've had two African-American quarterbacks face off against one another, Jalen Hurts, Patrick Mahomes. This is going to be really special, but also electric on the field. And so right now, the Eagles are one-and-a-half-point favorites as they get set to take on the Chiefs. And I'm curious from your take, who do you got winning this one? Because it feels like it could go either way. First of all, the QB situation is awesome. As someone who remembers James Harris with the Rams, and then you had Doug Williams win the Super Bowl with the Redskins, and then you had uh, Warren Moon had to go to Canada for five years because the NFL didn't want him. How stupid was that entire league at that point? Randall Cunningham was a, was a, a trendsetter, a groundbreaker. So it's awesome to see 
that situation in the Super Bowl. Uh, I want Kansas City to win because I want Andy Reid to get revenge on the team that fired him. And I, I can't think of another situation in NFL history where a coach was fired by a franchise. That franchise had success, and the coach went and had success as well. Both have Super Bowls since the firing, and now they're meeting. So one's going to walk away with two, either having vanquished the coach they fired or the coach is going to vanquish the team that fired him. And here's the other thing. Maybe had Philly kept – Reed, they would have the Super Bowl already, maybe win the Super Bowl and have Patrick Mahomes, but they have Jalen Hurts. So anyway, that aside, I want Kansas City to win, but I'm leaning a little Philly only because Mahomes is still a little bit banged up. Philly's got a really good defense and that run game, dude, that run game is just, uh, they just bulldoze San Francisco. Kansas City's run defense is solid, but I don't know if they're going to be able to hold up against Philadelphia. So I think Philadelphia is going to be able to control the clock and make enough plays and get after Mahomes enough to make it close. And then they're going to pull out pull it out in the end, but I will be pulling for Kansas City to prove me wrong. All right, Aaron. Well said. It should be a pretty fun one, but thanks again for helping carry the show here, my friend. Anytime you can step into the uh, don't co-pilot always? seat here and we can get don't this I- done. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll do it for this edition of Talking Ducks. Thanks again for joining us next week. We'll have more interviews from the Signing Night Live. We've got some special ones coming your way. Enjoy the big game this weekend, and we'll catch you next time.